Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand. Jerusalem has hit the brakes on Israel's plan to ease restrictions and return to normalcy after a jump in the number of coronavirus cases. The Jewish state has seen a rise in COVID-19 infections and has been forced to close more than 100 schools to prevent the further spread of the virus. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stressed the importance of social distancing, the use of masks, gloves, and proper hygiene. He appealed to the public to please follow the rules in order to save our economy, our health, and the lives of all of us. The Israel aerospace industry has successfully tested a new weapon system. Until recently, the Liora quasi-ballistic missile was highly classified, but after hitting targets at a range of 400 kilometers, the IAI announced that they had accomplished an unprecedented feat. Liora, the container-based surface-to-surface missile, was tested from a ship in the Mediterranean Sea to gauge its effectiveness at naval warfare. This weapon system was created to hide in plain sight on commercial freight ships, allowing them to be used as covert warships. The recent tests checked Liora's long and short-range capabilities, and the IAI said that in both scenarios, Liora hit its target within a margin of error fewer than 10 meters. Iranian-backed forces were targeted in a recent airstrike near the Syrian city of Deir Azur. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights confirmed that several major arms stockpiles were destroyed, and a dozen militiamen from Iraq and Afghanistan were killed in the attack. This same proxy army received a shipment of weapons just prior to the attack. This comes days after a convoy of Iranian military vehicles carrying heavy machine guns was bombed by a fighter jet in Syria. Israel has remained tight-lipped about the incidents, but has repeatedly warned Damascus that it will not tolerate Iranian entrenchment on its northern border and that the Syrian leadership will be held accountable for any and all attacks emanating from its territory. The Arab terrorist who murdered a 21-year-old Israeli soldier last month has been apprehended. Israel's internal security service, known as Shin Bet, announced that they have detained a 49-year-old resident of the Arab village of Yabed for the cold-blooded murder of First Sergeant Amit Ben Yagal. The Golani Brigade's reconnaissance unit was on a mission arresting terror suspects in Yabed when the accused ascended the roof of his building and threw a concrete slab onto the Israeli soldiers below. Ben Yagal sustained a mortal head wound in the attack. Both Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel's President Reuben Rivlin commended the IDF, Shin Bet and security forces on the capture of the murderer. President Rivlin promised that the Israeli leadership would act uncompromisingly against terrorism and its perpetrators to keep Israelis safe. A group of mayors from towns in Judea and Samaria expressed their support for U.S. President Donald Trump's plan to extend Israeli sovereignty throughout the Jewish heartland. Eleven city leaders recently met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss his strategy for applying sovereignty to Jewish communities throughout Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley. The municipal heads praised Trump for his bold moves to bring peace to the region. Oded Ravivi, the mayor of Ifrat, said the President of the United States is the leader of the most friendly administration towards Israel and the Jewish heartland. Norway has docked the Palestinian Authority's education system six months of funding over its incitement to violence in educational materials. The European Union called for an investigation into Palestinian curriculum after the NGO Impact SE reported hatred, violence and incitement to martyrdom in Palestinian textbooks. Just last month, the European Parliament passed resolutions condemning the Palestinian Authority for continuing to teach hate and violence against Jews. Jerusalem has announced the appointment of Amira Oren as its first female ambassador to Cairo. Israel's diplomatic relationship with Egypt is a sensitive but important one. The countries signed a peace treaty in 1979, but relations remain delicate. Egypt relies on Israel for intelligence and coordination as it fights Islamic rebels in the Sinai Desert and deals with Palestinian militants smuggling contraband through tunnels between Egypt and Gaza. Oren has served Israel's foreign ministry in Cairo before. In fact, she headed the foreign ministry's Egypt division. 
She also represented the Jewish state in Ankara, Turkey, and Brussels, Belgium. Jewish holy sites throughout the Arab world have been largely destroyed, and the few that remain are in danger. A report released by the Jewish Cultural Heritage Initiative paints a grim picture for ancient Jewish sites throughout the Middle East, many of which date back to Babylonian times. According to the report, nearly half of the Jewish heritage locations in Syria and one quarter of Jewish sites in Iraq have been completely destroyed. Jews had a long and rich history in the Arab lands of the Middle East until 1948, when the Arabs forced the Jews out of their homes with no warning, forcing them to leave everything behind. They still have not received reparations for property stolen in the expulsion. Now, in the absence of a prominent Jewish community to protect them, the holy sites are being systematically defaced and destroyed. These include synagogues, Jewish community historical records, and the tombs of biblical figures and prophets. The Turkish government continues to incite violence and provide financial incentives for terror on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Turkey has invested tens of millions of dollars in the Arab sector of Jerusalem through a network of radical Islamic nonprofit organizations. These groups encourage violence and demand loyalty to Ankara. An effort is being made to offset Turkey's growing influence in Arab sectors of the holy city. Saudi Arabia and Jordan have been holding secret talks with Israel to form a more moderate WAF council to quell disturbances on the Temple Mount. Saudi Arabia is the custodian for the holiest sites in Islam, located in Mecca and Medina, while Jordan has assumed responsibility for the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The goal of the clandestine negotiations, which have taken place since December, is for Riyadh to join Amman in custodianship over the Temple Mount and repress Turkey's radical influence in Jerusalem. The International Atomic Energy Agency has reported that Iran is breaching all restrictions of the nuclear deal. According to the agreement, Iran is allowed to possess no more than 447 pounds of enriched uranium, but the UN watchdog organization has confirmed that Tehran has nearly two tons of the substance used to make atomic weapons. The Islamic Republic is also over its allowance of heavy water. Tehran has repeatedly threatened to wipe Israel off the map, and Washington and Jerusalem both fear that when Iran obtains the proper materials, it will not hesitate to make good on its threat. For the first time in history, a commercial Israeli aircraft was allowed to enter Sudanese airspace. The El Al flight was en route to Tel Aviv from Buenos Aires. If Israel's national carrier is given permission to continue with this route, it will shave two hours off the flight time between Argentina and Israel's Ben-Gurion airport. A U.S. court has ruled that Iran and Syria are liable for American citizens wounded or killed in terror attacks in Israel. A Washington, D.C. magistrate decided that the Arab states were responsible since they provided material support to Islamic Jihad and Hamas, who perpetrated attacks that killed and wounded American citizens in the Jewish state. The court did not announce the amount of the damages. Neither Syria or Iran commented on the judgment. Israeli scientists are celebrating a major breakthrough in the research of Dead Sea Scroll fragments. In 1947, Bedouins discovered a treasure trove of ancient artifacts in the caves near Qumran overlooking the Dead Sea. This turned out to be a collection of hundreds of manuscripts from an ancient Jewish sect that fled the Romans in Jerusalem and hid their holy text in the deserts. While many of the scrolls were preserved, thousands of fragments remained undecipherable until Israeli researchers at Tel Aviv University and the Israel Antiquities Authority applied DNA sequencing. This allowed them to match the disintegrated fragments and even decipher the text. In a hopeful sign, Israelis returning to work outnumbered coronavirus layoffs 10 to 1. Israel's employment services reported that since the end of May, 56,937 Israelis went back to work, offset by just over 6,000 new job seekers. The number of Israelis gainfully employed is nearly 10 times that of those seeking employment. The Jewish state has been named the world's third leading startup ecosystem. Startup Blink released its annual ranking report, revealing that Israel overtook Canada and is now in third place behind the United States and the United Kingdom. The white city of Tel Aviv was recognized by the publication as the seventh leading city for startups worldwide. It noted that Israel is known as the startup nation for good reason. It is a relatively small country, which makes a substantial impact on the global startup ecosystem. 
Israeli archaeologists believe that they have discovered the Jezreel winery mentioned in both books of Kings. The ancient vineyard was discovered in 2013 and has gone through several seasons of extensive excavations. In 1 Kings, the Bible describes a negotiation for the vineyard, which was located next to King Ahab's palace. Naboth the Jezreelite refused to sell or trade the land because he had inherited it from his ancestors. Archaeologists explain that the ancient wine press and vineyard was discovered very close to Jezreel, which they know was continuously inhabited for thousands of years. The Bible details that King Ahab devised a plan to steal the Jezreel vineyard through the trickery of his wife Jezebel. God cursed Ahab and his 70 sons for his treachery, and later Ahab's son Joram met his fate at the hands of Jehu, who threw the body of the Sumerian king into the field of Jezreel. The Jewish state is preparing for a major increase in immigration. In what is being dubbed the Corona Effect, Officials from the Jewish agency are seeing a drastic number of inquiries from Jews wishing to move home to Israel after experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic. Josh Schwartz, the director of the Jewish agency, estimated that approximately 50,000 Jews will immigrate to Israel this year, which is almost twice the average and close to double the number who moved to the Holy Land in 2019. Karen Hayasod welcomed the news saying that it is standing by and ready to assist these new immigrants with support services that will help ease their transition and promote their full absorption and participation into Israeli society. That concludes the news portion of our show. Please stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Kay Wilson. She's a famous author and tour guide here in Israel. Kay, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Josh. Kay, tell us a little about your story. It's, it was in all the newspapers. It was a big media story. What happened? Take you back nine and a half years. Uh, working as an Israeli tour guide, guide, guiding a private client, a Christian American, Christine Lucan. We're on the National Trail, beautiful Shabbat day, and uh, I see two men in the bushes who ask us for water in Hebrew. I tell them I don't have any, they go away, feeling nervous about maybe they steal my backpack. Took out my little knife, I told Christine, let's just get back to the car, there's stuff we can do. We're hurrying back to the car, they jump on us from behind. In that scuffle, I managed to stab one very lightly in the, uh, in the nuts. And uh, they overpower us and they hold us for 30 minutes at knife point. They find my Israeli ID and after that they tie us with my shoelaces, tie our hands, they gag us with Christine's fleece, they take off my Star of David, say Allah Akbar, and they start butchering. And I played dead and I watched Christine hacked to death before my eyes. They leave, they come back, they stab me, just miss my heart, just to make sure I'm dead. They leave again, I have one last goal in life, which is to die nearer where I parked the car. So the police can find my body, I manage to stand, I turn my back on my friend, what's left of her. Gag bound barefoot with 13 machete wounds and over 30 broken bones, I manage to walk all the way back to the car, a mile. And the, the happy so-called ending of the story is that uh, they were apprehended very quickly because it was his DNA on my sleeve that helped the Shabak, you know, the Israeli Secret Service catch them. And they confessed to another murder that they'd committed 10 months previously, which had been unsolved. And when I was in court with them nine months later, the judge said, but why did you murder an American Christian? And they, I won't forget it, Josh. They sniggered and they smirked and they yawned and they said, oh, we thought she was Jewish. And they were served, uh, one got 120 years for also murdering Netta Blat Sorek, and the other person got 55 years. So you just came out now with a book about the story. What do you hope to achieve by getting this story out there and, and letting people know what happened to you? Um, I would like to uh, alert the world that first of all, Christine's murderers who execute, people who executed an American Christian, a human being, they are being rewarded a monthly salary by the Palestinian Authority. And this is monies that has been given 
uh, by the European Union and the British government. I'm, I'm also a British citizen. So I want to alert them to that. That's not what the book's about. The book is a memoir. I want to show them you know, what actually terrorism is, but I also wanted to show them the goodness of Israel. I mean, some of the reviews the book has got, I was very pleased because it's very funny in places because we are a bit of a crazy country. So I wanted to show the best there is, the humanity, the vulnerability, the innocence, the, the willingness to help, and then juxtapose that with just two people who could uh, hack at an innocent woman without blinking an eye. You know, it's interesting you bring up the, the pay for slay that the Palestinian Authority does. Uh, Trump uh, administration stopped it with the Taylor Force Act, but as you mentioned, it's still being done in Europe. How does it feel to be a British citizen knowing that your government is paying these people who hacked up your friend and, and nearly murdered you? Not my government, but I do have a British passport and I still have family in England. How does it feel? It's excruciating because my family in England through their taxes, they're actually financing this salary for the murderers. It's, it's an injustice. Uh, it's raw. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing for me. And it doesn't matter. I've written to every single British MP. I've sent them photos of my stab wounds. I've done everything I can. I've been ignored. They promised a government inquiry into the de Department for International Development. It never happened. I think it's obscene and good for Trump because I'd also been appealing to the previous American administration who did nothing for years. That's an interesting thing that you mentioned also about what they said at the trial, that you, they thought uh, the, that the person was Jewish. But wouldn't they just as happy to kill a Christian? I mean, they say first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. What, what do you think about that? I, I think certainly that's true. I can only relate to our particular case. They'd found my Israeli ID and it had Jew on it. It was the old ones. And they assumed that my friend was also Jewish. And we are talking about, I mean, really, we're talking about 1400 years of pogroms. And I have many friends who live under the Palestinian Authority. And they, they themselves tell me, they say, Kay, our education, our music, our summer camps is rife with incitement, where we are told that Jews are pigs and monkeys and unworthy of life. This is coming from the Palestinians who don't want it. You've lived in uh, London, England. You've lived in uh, Europe. The, the narrative there is so different, you know, the, your story and what happened and the fact that people are killing people just for being Jews or Christians, that doesn't get out there. Why are they blocking the true narrative of what's happening here? We're, we're a peaceful, democratic country and people are trying to kill us. I don't know, Josh. I always say, what, and I've spoken hundreds of times, I always say an Arab Muslim Israeli surgeon saved my life. I'm working on an educational program with Palestinians to stop incitement in the Palestinian Authority. I don't have a racist bone in my body, okay? With that, not one, not the BBC, not ITV, not all these big BBC, or how do you say, British TV stations, they've consistently refused to interview me. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe if I'd have gone like uh, across the, how do you say, the rainbow and unicorns path, like uh, this so-called cycle of violence, and it's not a cycle. It's very linear. If they stopped trying to murder us, we'd have peace tomorrow. Maybe if I'd bought into that tune and said, oh, we mustn't, we must, you know, we must all love and forgive, maybe they'd have me on their show. You know, you're not just an author, you're actually a public speaker. Uh, how are people impacted by having you speak to them and explain your story, and uh, what is the response you're getting? Um, well, pre-corona, <laughs> the response, usually when I speak, I mention, of course, the, the incitement and the rewarding of terrorism, but I like to impart to people what I've learned, you know, and I have learned things. It's like, and we're learning it, we've learned it through this pandemic, okay? We think we're in control. We're not in control. Things can happen tomorrow, and life isn't all about me, and we should really be thankful for every single moment that we have. So what I usually speak about is the personal effect, the good, not just the, the evil that it's impacted upon me, but the lessons, the life lessons I've learned. Okay, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would like to tell the audience, uh, whether you, if you, especially if you're living in Britain or Europe, lobby your governments and just know that the murders of my friend Christine Lucan have so far been paid over $80,000 of your money. So lobby your governments. That's the other thing I'd like to say. Secondly, we have one life and live it well. Thank you, Kay, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio.
Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Hayesod. I'm Sam Grundwerg, World Chairman of Karen Hayesod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. We live in a time where the God of Israel is fulfilling His prophecies right before our very eyes. Join us as we work together to defend the covenant. Those who dreamed about the Jewish state those who survived the Holocaust and found in Israel the anchor, the security. Those who wrought the historical miracle and against all odds established a state. Those who stepped into the breach and defended the young Jewish state, so many of them paid with their lives. Those who arrived in the homeland to their new home. Those who propelled Israel forward step after step. Those who stand at the technological vanguard and the loyal partners who ensure the continuation of the Zionist enterprise. All those are Karen Hayasod, because Karen Hayasod is Eretz Israel. The return of an ancient people to their biblical homeland, a nation whose values inspired mankind only to endure centuries of suffering the ultimate tale of redemption from the ashes of destruction. This remarkable story is the story of the State of Israel. It is also the story of Karen Hayasod. Thanks to the dedication of Karen Hayasod supporters, huge resources were available to make the State of Israel a reality. Founded in 1920, Karen Hayasod galvanized Jewish donors across the world in a unified effort to develop the infrastructure of the first sovereign Jewish state in 2,000 years. By the time the state of Israel was born in 1948, Karen Hayasod's funds had been the driving force behind the establishment of over 900 communities in the Jewish homeland. Its donors helped found many of the iconic institutions we know today, including the Hebrew University and Israel's Philharmonic Orchestra, ensuring that as Zachariah envisioned, Jerusalem's streets would once more be filled with boys and girls at play. Karen Hayasod's supporters also helped rescue tens of thousands of desperate Jews fleeing a burning Europe, bringing them to the sanctuary of the land of Israel. Ezekiel's prophecy of bringing dry bones to life had been fulfilled. Throughout the decades, Karen Hayasod has been there for Jewish people coming home. In the 1950s, by financing the creation of still vibrant cities, Eilat and Sterot, bringing to life Ben-Gurion's vision of making the Negev Desert bloom. In the 1960s and 70s, raising funds and providing a lifeline for the country's development during wartime and at the close of the century, helping to bring immigrants from the four corners of the earth in a modern day exodus, rescuing tens of thousands of Jews from Ethiopia and one million Jews from the former Soviet Union, delivering them from danger and distress. To this day, Karen Hayasod's activists continue their mission of Aliyah and absorption. Last year, more than 31,000 Jews were helped to make their lives in the land of their ancestors. Karen Hayasod remains at the heart of Israel's development, as Israel's barren land has been transformed into a hub of creativity, innovation, and success. Karen Hayasod's supporters have been there every step of the way. They have empowered 2,000 pioneering young Israelis to reinvigorate 65 distressed communities. All of this has been achieved through Karen Hayasod's ongoing efforts to build unbreakable bonds with Israel among Jews in the diaspora, Christians, and people of faith from across the world. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord says, there is a hope for your future. Your children will return to their borders. Every day, Karen Hayasod supporters are making this vision a reality. Thanks to Karen Hayasod, the state of Israel continues to grow from strength to strength. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. 
assist Karen Hayasud to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. This is a message to every parent, to every mother, and to every father. The other day, Israeli preschoolers were playing in their yard. Out of nowhere, an innocent-looking balloon descended upon them. Yet this was no ordinary balloon. Palestinian terrorists attached burning flames to it. They turned a child's toy into a weapon of terror. We smell the fire, one preschooler shouted, standing between a, a sand pit and a red slide. And these, these beautiful children were nearly burned alive. Their brave teacher led the terrified children to safety just in time. Thankfully, their precious lives were spared. Now think about this. What does it say about the terrorists that run Gaza that they try to burn Israeli preschoolers alive? And so when you drop your son or daughter off at school today, I want you to hug them. Hug them especially tight. Tell them you love them. Tell them you'll always protect them. Then call up another mother or father and tell them this story. This is what Israel defends itself against every single day. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land after 2,000 years of exile. But millions of Jews are still longing to come home. Anti-Semitism threatens many of the Jews. We must rescue them before the window of opportunity slams shut. Bless Israel by supporting Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Together, we can fulfill the prophecy of the Bible. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us next week for all of your Israel updates.